A bit of backstory, I'm now the um, delirium lead for the trust. Um, I'm looking at and trying to work my way through the current guidelines. Um, and uh, what I've realised is there's a huge hole and that most of our guidelines look at um, uh, delirium in the care of the elderly population, but they aren't looking at the rest of the population. Um, so the first thing I thought I'd do is write some post-operative delirium guidelines alongside some new guidelines for the trust, which will cover the whole trust. And I thought I'd sit down and have a chat to you guys about it, tell you the recommendations that I think need to be put forward and actually put it out here as a bit of a, um, a, a mind splurge. What I'm hoping is that I'll get some feedback from you guys and have my email addresses on the next um, slide. Um, so my objectives are um, to highlight the size of the problem, to explore a little bit the pathology of post-operative delirium or POD, as I'm now saying it, um, discuss some of the modifiable or non-modifiable risk factors, um, and then discuss the role of the anaesthetic team in post-op um, uh, delirium. And during the whole presentation in the um, bold script um, is going to be the recommendations that I'm planning to introduce to the trust. Um, in the colour coded theme, any modifiable um, risk factors are in red. Um, and that might give us a bit of a prompt about things that we can potentially change for our anaesthetic pr practices to reduce the risk of post-optic delirium. Those are my email addresses. Paul.james3 at NUH, um, but I think that's going to be defunct in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so I've been demoted to Paul.james16 um, uh, uh, with the NHS net me email. So please feel free, um, uh, if you don't want to talk to me at the end of this, to send me recommendations, discussions, um, anything you want about delirium, and I'll try and answer as much as possible. You probably all know um, about delirium and interesting when I was doing a bit of research for post-operative delirium when I typed in post-op delirium couldn't get a particularly good um, definition um, but what I did find is a fantastic presentation by Abby Noah done about two years ago so I'm not going to be any better than what Abby um, uh, has presented to you guys um, but I'm going to give you this. This is the definition from the ICD-11 catalogue or categorization. And I've highlighted the, um, the important bits about it. So delirium is a disturbance of attention, orientation and awareness. And it develops within a short period of time, causes significant confusion, global neurocognitive impairment, and it is fluctuant. Um, uh, I think it is important to know that there are direct physiological effects and physiological effects. Um, and there are also effects from medications and multiple other unknown or etiological factors. Um, and that's why it's such a tricky and difficult field, because there are so many reasons why patients can get delirium. Um, and there are so many causes and so many things that we probably need to be more mindful of to, to reduce the incidence of delirium. Um, it is pretty much a silent um, uh, epidemic. Um, uh, there are many patients across the trust who I imagine at this very moment are suffering from either hypoactive or hyperactive delirium. And what we know from the evidence is it increases um, uh, the length of stray by anywhere up to three to five days and might cost the healthcare um, anywhere between eight and ten thousand pound extra per patient um, uh, per delirium episode. Um, so you can see there's both health economic reasons to try and um, improve our delirium care, but also more importantly, I suppose, patient reasons why we need to try and um, uh, both be uh, mindful of the, the causes of delirium, mindful of the um, ways of trying to prevent delirium and then very mindful of um, uh, trying to pick it up and treat it as quickly as possible. So it is a big problem, actually, um, in the general surgical population the incidence of post-op delirium is somewhere between two and a half and three percent but when you start going in the older population and we seem to be seeing an increasing uh, uh, amount of older people requiring quite significant operations it can be up to 20 percent some of the patients over the age of 85 have a 6.2 percent time increased risk of delirium um, as opposed to those younger than 65 and then it depends on surgical size as well, whether or not you've got a risk of delirium or what your risk of delirium actually is. So limb extremity surgery carries a relatively low risk. It fits with the sort of general population of two and a half to three percent. 
But when you start looking at people having truncal surgery, it can go up to 20%. If that surgery is done as an elective, the risk is lower. But if it's an emergency surgery, and again, we're seeing more emergency surgery, the risk goes up to almost 45%. And that's three times comparable to the elective procedures. And then if we talk about really complex surgery, stuff like the thoracic surgery, HPB surgery, you know, major joint redos, that kind of stuff, um, we get up to about a 50 percent risk of post-operative delirium. And those patients that come through to ITU and I've also um, uh, the ITU lead for delirium, um, we see anywhere up to about 70 percent of patients that have a delirious um, episode. So it is a huge, huge problem. One in so seven in 10 patients. There is an increasing number of patients coming in with fractured neck um, uh, Up to 70 percent of those patients will develop post-op delirium. Um, and the presence is about seven to ten times increase in the 30 day mortality across all patients. And as I said earlier, the additional health care per cost is up to about eight thousand pounds, which is quite significant. What causes delirium? Well, a, a, again, I, I suppose that's a really difficult question to answer. And, and Abby explored that on a presentation, which you can still get on the NUH YouTube um, uh, channel. Um, uh, there are 2.57 million hits if you go through Google to look to see if you can explain what causes delirium. Um, uh, so in this one slide, I'm probably not going to be able to answer that question. Um, but some of the better theories are a neuroinflammation, possibly possibly triggered by a peripheral inflammation. Um, and you can imagine this surgical sympathetic response or surgical insult plus or minus exposure to the anaesthetic agents, which might cause an inflammatory response, um, uh, might be causative. Um, from a circadian rhythm, when we know sleep is exceedingly important um, in health, from a circadian rhythm point of view, um, uh, opioids disrupt the sleep art architecture. Um, and pretty much every patient who has some form of anaesthetic will have opioids at some point, apart from Steve's um, uh, sedated OGD and um, uh, uh, EBUS patients. Um, uh, we know that opioids basically um, reduce your stage three and stage four sleep, your REM sleep, the really important bits of sleep where your brain is resting uh, recuperating and probably where your brain is working metabolically to reduce toxic chemicals. And we know that that's reduced by about 30 to 40 percent in patients who have opioids. We also know that surgical trauma increases cortisol, cortisol secretion um, and cortisol um, suppresses melatonin. Melatonin is another extremely important sleep hormone. It's essentially what drives you to sleep when you're exposed to less sunlight, the amount of melatonin in your brain increases and that as it gets to a trigger point triggers sleep. Anesthetic agents in themselves um, uh, will reduce the secretion of melatonin. Um, so at least one plausible theory about delirium and or post-operative delirium is it has a massive impact on sleep um, and sleep being exceedingly important in care and health care and brain health. Um, it may be that that is one of the reasons why patients are getting significant amounts of delirium. There might be a neurotransmitter imbalance um, that might be um, a, an impact on acetylcholine and um, dopamine balance. And that might in itself be triggered and or affected by the anesthetics agents we use. Um, and we know that there is a glucocorticoid or stress response release associated with um, uh, any surgical insult. And that might actually expose um, uh, cerebral neurons to potential damage. And that damage may mean that they're less effective. Um, and that may lead to more neurochemical imbalance, which leads to delirium. So what are the risk factors that, that we're seeing across the population? And I've gone through some of these, but I'll just reiterate. And some of these are modifiable risk factors. I looked at patient risk, risk factors first and the most significant risk factor. Um, and I think this is fairly obvious because the higher age 
um, population tend to be far more exposed to, to episodes of delirium. But the risk increases significantly as you get over the age of 75. And then as you start to get older, so over the age of um, 75, there's a two and a half times increase. And as I said, over the age of 80, you get somewhere in a 6.7% times increase. Those patients that have got underlying pre-existing cognitive impairment are at a very high risk of post-operative delirium. And that's one of the triggers to start thinking about things that you could do to mitigate risk. Um, we know that males are more likely to have post-operative delirium as opposed to um, uh, females. Um, significant cardiovascular comorbidities and peripheral vascular disease um, uh, therefore probably um, pointing towards a sort of neurovascular problem um, uh, but those patients are at increased risk of delirium and then some modifiable reasons so polypharmacy um, so significant use of multiple drugs and again um, that's cre crept into healthcare quite significantly can increase your risk of delirium both um, coming into hospital being in hospital and then post operating um, a, a post an operation and we know um, specifically from uh, um, a, an operative point of view that prolonged fasting and prolonged dehydration will increase your risk of post-operative delirium. Um, greater than six hours fluid fasting prior to an operation carries an odds ratio risk of 10.6%, uh, sorry, 10.6 for delirium um, development. There are obviously well-established um, uh, perioptive um, uh, starvation and fasting and dehydration or fluid resuscitation um, guidelines, um, but there are um, undoubtedly circumstances where we're maybe not absolutely 100% on those. Um, and I suppose, uh, again, stratifying risk and making sure that those patients that would be at increased risk of delirium, um, that we minimise both their fasting time and maximise the amount of fluid resuscitation um, uh, they receive prior to their operation would be an important way of trying to reduce the risk of delirium. There are ongoing patient risk factors, uh, other specific comorbidities, and they're detailed there. Um, uh, I'm going to go on. I was shaking my head as Laxmi was talking about the use of benzodiazepines. Um, and I think the number one um, uh, drug cause of delirium across the trust, certainly um, within critical care. And if you look at the evidence base is benzodiazepines um, and outside of specific um, uh, treatment programs, for example, alcohol, drug withdrawal, um, uh, I would urge everybody to throw away the benzodiazepines and to stop using them uh, because they have got such a significant risk of increased post-operative delirium or delirium within the, the hospital. I've already talked about deranged normal physiology, sleep impairment being one of the things that is quite significant. Another thing to think about is sensory impairment and those patients that are either um, have hearing or visual impairment are a much greater increased risk of delirium. And that's very, very simple for us to be able to sort out, making sure that they've got their glasses in recovery, making sure they've got their hearing aids in recovery, thinking about strategies for communication with patients if neither of those are possible um, in the recovery period. The American Geriatric Society guidelines suggest that any two of those risk factors would increase and be predictive of post-operative delirium when there are no um, risk, uh, uh, as opposed to when there are no other risk factors. Um, and then I did a little bit look to see whether or not there was any validated risk tools that we could consider introducing to the trust. And interestingly, there aren't any validated risk tools. Um, there aren't any frequently used risk tools um, uh, for post-operative del delirium risk. Um, and that may be an area of um, uh, research um, that we could look at in the future. Um, about creating maybe a Nottingham post-op delirium risk tool. Um, and I know we've had quite a lot of success with the Nottingham um, uh, hip fracture scores. And if anyone wants to um, look at that as a project, any of the trainees on the line, I think that would be a really interesting thing. Give me, drop me an email um, and we can talk about what things I think might be worth us looking at.
broadly speaking, um, those patients that are at increased risk and those patients that I think we need to be thinking about are those with a increased ASA score. So ASA 2 or above um, and over the age of 65, those are two risk factors um, that we need to start thinking about mitigating against post operative delirium risk. Steve, can we go to the next slide, please? These are the, the recommendations that I'm hoping to try and get introduced trust-wide. Um, uh, and I know I'm being a little bit forceful and possibly I need to run them past um, uh, some of you that might be interested in this field um, uh, within the anaesthetic department. So please, again, drop me an email and we can talk about it. Um, but my recommendations are that we should make sure that we assess the risk factor for post-operative delirium. Um, uh, and take those into account. Um, uh, it's recommended that anyone with older age, um, uh, ASA grade greater than two, comorbidity index, this Charleston comorbidity index greater than 22, or a, a reduced mini mental state examination score less than 25. Um, uh, those things are used as surrogates for risk factor. And if we have patients that are deemed high risk for post-operative delirium, we should actually be thinking about cancelling um, and or um, uh, consenting those patients for that risk um, and discussing it with available family and carers. Um, uh, I think personally that we should be documenting those discussions in the pre-optive anaesthetic assessment um, and I reckon that those patients that are at high risk or exceeding the high risk should be discussed with the MDT um, and um, factors put in place to try and mitigate and reduce the risk post-operatively. I personally, uh, I think that we should avoid um, excessive fasting um, and there are established NUH guidance, but I put that in there just to, to, to um, uh, reinforce that point. And then I suggest that all patients at risk of delirium should have a comprehensive medication review conducted by someone who is experienced in doing that. And that may be the ward pharmacist to look at, you know, potential interactions and the polypharmacy. Or that might even be a discussion with the, um, uh, the healthcare or the elderly team um, uh, uh, about whether or not there's anything that they can do to reduce the risk. There are surgical risk factors, of course. Some of these are um uh unavoidable and some of those might be less avoid might be avoidable we know as i've already said increasingly um invasive surgery increases the risk um uh, so truncal surgery a fourfold increase when compared to limb extremity surgery and emergency surgery increases the risk and as i've said post-operative delirium in the critical care um, uh, population is exceedingly high one thing that we can consider is length of surgery. Now, I know that there are situations when surgery is difficult or the surgery is always going to be planned to be long. Um, but if we think it's going to be a long surgical procedure, then maybe we should be instituting some other bits and pieces, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, uh, to try and reduce risk. So what interoptive risk factors do we have? And this is probably where um, uh, you brilliant people as an anaesthetist um, come in. Um, and I can no longer say I'm an anaesthetist, but I've obviously been there before. Um, uh, pretty much all of my anaesthetics and inductions became hypotensive, which just showed that I wasn't particularly good at doing what I was doing. But hypotension is an exceedingly high risk factor for um, post-operative delirium. And again, some of the evidence would suggest that a map less than 55 millimetres of mercury at any time magnifies the risk um, and that the duration of that mean arterial pressure drop. And um, so the longer it is there, the more likely that is to occur. Interoperative BP variation swings from up and down, um, uh, sometimes unavoidable, I know, but sometimes relatively avoidable, do cause and maybe a compounding risk factor. Um, and then mild hypothermia, so 36 to 35 degrees carries an increased odds ratio of 1 to 1, well, 1.15, whereas severe hypothermia carries an increased risk ratio of about 1.5. Um, so those two things are easily um, uh, managed. And again, I know there is established um, uh, protocol for both temperature management and warming interoperatively and postoperatively. I put a question mark after excessive de depth of anaesthesia um, because I've um, uh, gone through as much of the evidence as I can find. Um, and it's not hugely strong um, uh, to suggest that 
um, uh, management of depth of anesthesia makes a, um, a, a significant um, improvement in um, uh, reducing the risk of post-op delirium. But I still think it is important, and I, I suggest um, and go on to talk about the recommendations that if I think patients are high risk, then depth of anesthesia monitoring um, uh, should be should be used no matter um, what technique of anesthetic you use. Now, I, I, I've been out of anesthetic practice for a while. I, I imagine that a, a lot of you are doing this anyway. So feel free to pull me up on that and say we're already doing it. Anesthetic choice is a difficult one. Um, uh, and again, I cannot find any significant evidence that would point to one anesthetic versus another. Um, uh, and I would suggest that it doesn't really matter what technique you're using, either TIVA um, or um, uh, an innovational anesthetic. Um, uh, what I suppose is more important is uh, mitigating against the risks above of hypotension, BP variation. Um, and um, hypothermia. So here are my um, my ongoing recommendations for that. And I just saw one of the um, uh, chats pop up about um, evidence. Um, what I'm going to do after we've had a discussion about this, and when I've finished doing the document as a draft, I will send it out to the to the anaesthetic consultants. There is an extensive um, over 50 um, uh, references within the document. Um, uh, for you guys to, to have a look at. And I've gone into more detail about the actual evidence base for all of these recommendations um, within that document. So I hope that if you're not um, uh, uh, too fed up of hearing me speak, you might not be too head up, fed up about reading the document I've created to have a look through it. And again, I'd be really happy um, to get some feedback from that. But my recommendations would suggest that we consider the use of depth of anesthesia um, for those patients that are deemed high risk um, uh, for de developing um, post-op de delirium, but there aren't any specific modalities of anesthesia that they can be recommended um, to mitigate against that. Obviously, avoiding interruptive hypertension is something that we'll all try and do as much as possible, um, but we could consider strategies to reduce the risk of that in those patients that are going to be high risk. And if you um, recall, I said those are the patients with two or more significant risk factors. Um, and then, of course, um, establish guidelines through the AAGPI and NUH that um, uh, we can manage hypothermia. Here are some of the post-op risk, risk factors that are worth considering. It's not just in the um, uh, the recovery room, but going on to um, those patients on the ward. And I know most anaesthetic doctors are able to review their patients at 24 hours as well. Um, or if not, these are things that can be um uh passed on to to the team that are going to continue to look after the patients in the ward but low hemoglobin hypoxemia um uh prolonged intubation and the, you know that's really getting at those patients who are on them uh who are on itu um, and pain um uh, are all important um post-optive risk factors that increase um post-optive delirium uh, difficult to really manage hypoalbuminemia in, hypoalbuminemia in the short term, um, but a low albumin is probably indicative of a poor nutritional state, plus or minus an inflammatory state, plus or minus a, a sicker patient. Those patients that have had liver failure are obviously much more increased risk of post-op with delirium. And again, it's worth just considering those patients and those with um, uh, uh, renal failure. And then the sleep weight disturbances and the use of benzodiazepines postoperatively um, uh, also increase the risk of postop delirium. I, I, I didn't really say, but the sort of uh, postop delirium time, um, uh, if you look at um, uh, all the evidence and all the discussions, um, is anywhere from five minutes after emergency of anesthesia to five days after the anesthetic event. There really isn't any pharmacological um, uh, prevention. Um, uh, I, I wish that I could turn around and say that there are um, uh, brilliant drugs that will reduce this risk, um, but there aren't. There are drugs that increase the risk, and I've already laboured that point, benzodiazepines are bad, um, uh, but there aren't any drugs that are particularly good. There's been extensive research in dexmetomidine, and I heard um, uh, a couple of people talking about dex for sedation. It probably is an excellent sedative agent, 
there is a couple of studies that show a reduction in post-op delirium associated with dexamethamidine and cardiac surgery, but many other studies that show no um, improvement in benefit. If you have a look at all the societal guidelines, European Society of Anesthesia, the AAGBI, the um, uh, all, all the other the Royal Colleges, um, none of them, none of them um, suggest the use of dexamethamidine as a, a an agent to reduce the risk of delirium. Interestingly, the European Society do say that in patients that are a high risk, you can consider use of dex. There's been a, um, a recently published um, critical care paper, the A2B trial, which we were involved in on. Um, uh, on ITU, um, uh, the use of dexamethamidine as a sedative agent to um, reduce the risk of delirium. Um, interestingly, that was compared to clonidine in usual care, um, and um, uh, the results were slightly unusual in that there appeared to be no effect or a slightly increased effect with the use of dexamethamidine. So I don't think it's the answer. It may it may form one part of a, um, a, a process to try and reduce the risk. I'm labouring the point. Benzodiazepines are a, a, a bad idea, um, but also a bad idea is inadequate analgesia. And that is quite difficult to control. And I, I remember from my own personal practice that um, uh, uh, post-operative um, uh, analgesia requirements I was always I always found it very very difficult to know whether or not I was gonna over treat or under treat these patients but what we do know is that there's a three times increased risk of post-operative delirium associated with pain and so employing strategies that will reduce the risk of pain post-optively are exceedingly important and again I know um, that you guys will work very hard to try and prevent post-op pain Opioids um, aren't necessarily um, the answer um, and um, the recommendations would suggest um, that we use um, opioid sparing techniques to reduce the risk of post-op delirium. Um, and so that's consideration for neuroaxial blockade or um, uh, peripheral nerve blocks. One study called the DEXET study, which was looked to patients um, who uh, were undergoing cardiac surgery. There's always lots of studies in cardiac surgery because I think they're an easy population to, um, to study. Um, showed that paracetamol use reduced the incidence of post-op delirium with a number needed to treat a 5.6. We are awaiting more data on a wider um, uh, uh, population. There's a trial called the Pandora trial at the moment, which I think is just closed. And I imagine the results will be out in the next 12 to 18 months, depending on how much um, statistics they have and how many, um, uh, how much number crunching there is. Um, but it is worth considering paracetamol in um, uh, as many patients as you think is necessary. Uh, and again, it almost felt like a reflex when I was doing anaesthetic practice. And I wonder whether or not it continues to be um, uh, continues to be that. Um, so here are the recommendations that um, I'm going to suggest. Um, uh, don't you routinely use dexamethamidine? Um, uh, it doesn't seem to be an adjuvant that will reduce the risk of post-op delirium. Oh, I labour the point again. Perioptive benzodiazepines are um, are bad, um, and um, outside of uh, established um, treatment programs, for example, alcohol withdrawal, drug withdrawal, I'm trying to avoid them. Uh, perioptive analgesia are exceedingly points of importance, and paracetamol might reduce the incidence of post-op delirium, um, uh, and is worth considering certainly in high-risk patients. As I said, there isn't any well-established perioptive screening um, uh, to assess risk, but post-operatively, um, uh, the most, or within our trust anyway, the most frequently used tool is a tool called the 4AT score. Um, uh, and if you haven't seen it before, give it a quick Google. It's a relatively straightforward four questions, um, a, a, a bit like a truncated mini mental score. Um, it comes out um, uh, with the score, and if the score is above um, uh, above five, um, then patients have a, um, a probable delirium. 
We have it now on nerve centre. Um, so it's one of the mandatory assessments in over the age of 65. So all patients that come to you, the over the age of 65 should have had it done. Um, and I have recently um, uh, gotten the um, uh, trust to um, put a sticker or a banner um, on all of those patients that are at risk of um, delirium through the 480 score. And you'll see it as a blue um, a sticker on their nerve centre saying probable delirium. Uh, equally, it will also highlight whether or not the patient is not at risk of delirium or at risk of um, uh, cognitive impairment. Um, uh, and I think screening for post-optic delirium should probably be done in the post um, uh, in the recovery room or the PACU. Um, patients um, sometimes stay in here or up to an hour or two hours, depending on bed availability. And I think that is a, a good opportunity for us to be able to um, to screen them there. And what I would suggest is there is routine routinely assess patients in the post uh, in the PACU. I'm calling it a PACU. I don't know if everyone does that, um, but we should be using a 4AT score in all the patients post-operatively to assess the risk of delirium and or the development of delirium. Um, and then when patients are um, taken back to um, uh, back to the ward, um, our current protocol is the use of the NEWS2 score and the NEWS2 score brings up confusion and the recommendations that are now hopefully going to be trust wide is there if there is a new confusion on the NEWS2 um, then patients should have a repeat 4AT score again screening for delirium and if the patient has a positive delirium then that should be discussed with the um, uh, with the um, anaesthetic and or the parent team to explain the, um, uh, that they've got post-op delirium and then we can start looking at their risk factors and whether or not there's any anything that we can do to improve their delirium. Uh, as I said, post-op delirium can occur anywhere up to five days following the anaesthetic. Um, uh, so something just to be mindful of in, in, in all of our patients. Treatment recommendations, uh, uh, this in itself is probably a whole talk, so I'm just going to give you a, 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 a one slide synopsis. Importantly, there are no significant pharmacological treatments that we can use in delirium. Um, Haloperidol has been looked at, quetiapine has been looked at, all of the atypical antipsychotics. Um, uh, and um, to be honest, none of them carry significant positive evidence for um, the uh, treatment uh, and reduction of length of time of delirium, which is rather dissatisfactory. Um, and we probably need to take a step back from treating and try and prevent as much as possible. Obviously, avoid hypoxia, um, uh, which um, uh, is a given, I hope. Um, and then Drugs really should only be considered in patients who are at risk of harm to themselves or others. Um, uh, when we are using pharmacotherapy for the treatments of delirium, we should try and use the lowest possible dose for the shortest possible time. Um, we have made the mistake in critical care of putting people onto um, atypical antipsychotics for the management of their delirium. Um, and those patients have gone home and returned 12 months later, still taking those um, uh, atypical antipsychotics with no signs of delirium. Um, so short courses um, uh, for um, the minimal amount of time with a minimal dose um, would be really important. There are lots of non-pharmacological interventions and there is much more weight of evidence against those. Um, so regular reorientation of patients ensuring patients have their normal sensory aids so that's glasses and hearing aids trying to promote good sleep hygiene and in the back of my mind that i'm, I'm hoping that as part of and as, as this role evolves i might be able to try and improve sleep across the trust as well i think there are very simple things that we can recommend like the uses of um, uh, eye mask and earplugs and again there is some really good evidence that suggests that promoting good sleep reduces the risk of delirium Obviously, um, uh, pain control, I've already talked about that, but early mobilisation is another um, important um, uh, thing to try and do. So if you can get 
patients mobilizing quickly um, uh, then you start to get them back into a sort of normal routine much quicker um, and it seems to reduce the risk of delirium if we prevent and identify um, uh, surgical complications early that will reduce risk um, uh, and also maintaining things like optimal hydration and nutrition normal bladder and bowel function um, and then trying to um, reduce the risk associated with things like catheters and if you look at the the broader population of patients developing delirium uh, catheterization in itself seems to be a significant risk factor um, and I don't know whether or not that is because the patients are more unwell and are requiring catheterization or the catheterization um, uh, somehow leads to the patient um, developing or increasing the risk of them developing delirium. It's, it's not particularly clear. Um, uh, as I've said there, avoiding hypoxia and providing supplementary oxygen is important and uh, entirely appropriate. So what next? Um, uh, so I'm using this as a little bit of uh, advert. Um, for what I'm trying to do with delirium care. I know Thea's on the line and therefore I'm just uh, I'm trying to justify the, the, the PAs that I'm getting for this. Um, but um, what I'm hoping is that I create a cycle within delirium care. My initial um, uh, work has been rewriting the trust guidelines and writing the um, a, a additional things like post-optive delirium, delirium within the emergency department and screening within the emergency department. Um, and, and I'm getting very close. I had an IT failure, which they wiped my hard drive and therefore I lost um, uh, three months of work and six and a half thousand words. But I'm getting back to, to, to where I need to be. And once once I've got that and um, uh, submitted that for ratification across the trust, what I'm hoping to do is create um, uh, an education package um, uh, for everybody across the trust. And I don't know whether or not I'm going to be able to make that into a mandatory tra um, training package, but I'm certainly hoping to to have something where we can um, uh, publicise and educate um, uh, delirium. Um, uh, it is well uh, managed in um, the healthcare of the elderly wards because they see it very frequently but I think they see it less frequently and manage it less well in the post-operative wards um, and so I think it's something that we can improve. Uh, once, I have, uh, once I've got that up and running my plan is to try and audit where we are and what we're doing um, and then I'm hoping to look into avenues for research um, uh, and if anyone is interested in post-op delirium as a um, uh, uh, as a topic, I think I oh, I know Abby's pretty interested in it. But if anyone else is interested in, it, or if anyone else has got some ideas that I can help with, or um, uh, they want some, to talk to me about these things, then that I can see what I can do. There is very little funding for for this kind of thing across the trust at the moment, but who knows what we can um, what we can get in the future. Um, so I'm sorry that if I sound like I was a bit preachy, um, uh, it's a bit of a whistle stop tour about delirium or post-op delirium. Um, uh, I hope that I've stimulated some interest um, and I would love to hear any, um, uh, any questions and I'll try and answer them. 